I'd like to welcome you to the ISO 9001-2015 Preparing for a Successful Transition webinar. My name is Joseph Krolikowski and I am the Technical Director of Perry Johnson Registrars. A couple of notes for you. Uh, all participants are on mute. Uh, but we definitely want to answer your questions. So please use the question portion of the dashboard and we will answer your questions at the conclusion of our presentation. Our topics for today, we're going to have a discussion on where the standards come from, uh, the ISO standards. We're going to have an examination of why the changes were so dramatic on this particular uh, date. We're going to take a refreshed look at the timeline for transition. We're going to explore what the key changes to the standard are. We will answer what I'm sure for many of you is a key question. Uh, do you have to overhaul your current system? Uh, I have some FAQs from past presentations, some final comments, and then we will absolutely take your questions. The ISO, uh, the letters ISO, uh, roughly stand for the International Organization for Standardization. Now, what the ISO is, is a collective. Uh, it's made up of numerous international members. Uh, there's representation from uh, each of the major industrialized nations, and uh, they are a body that serves uh, solely uh, for the purpose of writing standards. Uh, now each of those standards is assigned a technical committee or TC. Uh, the committee that works with ISO 9001 is TC 176 uh, and TC 176 itself also includes um, representation from each of the major industrialized nations. Now here in the United States our representative uh, to the ISO and to TC-176 is the American National Standards Institute, or ANSI. Now as to why the changes were so dramatic with the 2015 edition, um, the ISO recognized uh, that the needs of the industries that use ISO 9001 have evolved, and they're going to continue to evolve uh, based on changing needs from those industries. Uh, obviously, ISO uh, wants to see ISO 9001 uh, continue to grow into more sectors, more industries, uh, particularly those in service sectors. Um, there was a targeted effort on this uh, rewrite to simplify some of the language that's used uh, to try to promote uh, a better understanding and a more consistent interpretation. And perhaps their most uh, uh, important goal, uh, they wanted to improve the cross compatibility between standards uh, for those companies that want to achieve uh, more than one certification. Perhaps we have some folks on our call today uh, for whom that applies. Now back when the 9001-2015 standard was under development, uh, Nigel Croft, who is the TC-176 chairperson, he was asked, uh, what is it that you're trying to accomplish? What is it that the committee is trying to accomplish with this latest version of ISO 9001? And Nigel expressed uh, three uh, key ideas, three primary focuses uh, for this particular uh, rewrite. Um, first, uh, the fostering of a process approach. And Nigel explained that, of course, uh, the committee views processes as uh, systematic, as being managed. Uh, processes are rooted in results. Processes try to foster consistency uh, and so forth. Uh, the second idea that Nigel expressed as important was plan, do, check, act. Uh, this is, I would argue, uh, an extension of the first idea, uh, the whole aspect that uh, processes and systems are planned, the execution of processes and systems should be controlled. Therein lies the, the do step, the checking aspects, the, the monitoring aspects, uh, and then actions based on the results of those checks. Um, 
these two ideas, of course, uh, have been a part of ISO 9001 since the 2000 revision of the standard. Uh, the new idea is risk-based thinking, uh, at least in terms of uh, being a named term, risk-based thinking is new. Uh, as we will see as we uh, dig through our presentation today, uh, I would uh, propose that risk-based thinking is not really uh, all that new of an idea. Uh, but uh, again, uh, process approach and plan, do, check, act, these are both legacy ideals. Risk-based thinking uh, as a term is new, conceptually not so new. Let's take a refreshed look now at the timeline for transition and get a sense of uh, uh, where we've been and what lies ahead. Now any ISO published standard goes through a, a variety of phases and uh, uh, in some cases uh, these steps might be repeated, uh, but the, the general uh, path to the issuance of a standard uh, is generally going to follow these steps. Um, we had a committee draft uh, that was issued in June of 2013. This was a, a fairly limited circulation document. Pretty much just committee members uh, were able to view this. In May of 2014, we saw the issuance of the draft international standard. Now that document uh, was purchased uh, fairly uh, extensively, and in some cases there were companies that attempted to implement uh, based on what was stipulated in the draft international standard. Uh, in July of 2015, we saw the final draft international standard, or FDIS, this uh, document uh, was almost, uh, to the word, uh, a duplicate, a match, uh, for what became the final published standard, which of course was issued in September of 2015, the certifiable official ISO 9001-2015 standard. Now looking ahead, we have one uh, last threshold to clear, and that is uh, in September of 2018, all of the ISO 9001-2008 companies that wish to continue to maintain an ISO, cert an ISO 9001 certification will need to have completed their transition to the new standard. And so we do have our new standard. It was published on September 15th of 2015 and is available for purchase directly from the ISO. Uh, the standard represents the culmination of nearly three and a half years of work going all the way back to the issuance of Annex SL back in 2012. And based on that publication date, uh, we now know uh, the official cutoff for ISO 9001-2008. And that is going to be September 14th of 2018. After that date, ISO 9001-2008 will cease to be a viable standard. Uh, we have uh, prepared a policy uh, on the cutoff for ISO 9001 auditing. Uh, that's available uh, in our uh, FAQ document uh, that you can get on our website at www.pjr.com. Uh, additionally, we have prepared uh, a client memorandum with some more uh, specific details regarding our transition policy. Uh, if you want to have a copy of that, uh, please inquire with either your salesperson or your scheduler. Now in terms of the key changes to the standard, uh, any discussion of ISO 9001-2015 uh, has to begin with a discussion of Annex SL. What is Annex SL? Well, Annex SL, as the name would imply, uh, it's an annex. It's a portion. Uh, it is not a standalone document, but rather a part of a much larger document. Uh, and that document is the ISO IEC Directives Part 1. Um, and in this case, uh, the Consolidated ISO Supplement Procedures specific to ISO. 
Um, this is a standard on how to write standards, and it covers all of the phases. And within Annex SL, you have um, a, a, a lot of, of specified content. It, it represented an interesting change uh, to how standards are written. Now, uh, I've actually provided a link in my presentation uh, to the um, uh, Directives Part 1, if you're so inclined. It is available on the ISO website and can be viewed by anybody. So if you want to review Directives Part 1 and Annex SL therein for yourself, uh, the link has been provided. Now, Annex SL was written back in 2012, and it was the output of a special committee uh, of the ISO called the Joint Technical Coordination Group. And what it is, you can think of it as a 10-section blueprint for the writing of ISO standards. And it's through Annex SL that we have uh, these common terms, these core definitions. Uh, we were talking earlier about the ISO's desire to have improved cross-compatibility between standards. Well, it's through Annex SL uh, that this is going to be accomplished. Uh, because uh, all of the ISO standards have to abide by the Annex SL structure. So, for example, in the past, if a company wanted to have ISO 9001 and ISO 14001, uh, a lot of those companies found that it was difficult to do uh, that without, uh, at the same time, having two sets of documentation. Well. Now, with the Annex SL common format, it's the same 10 sections, the same core requirements. So uh, now uh, the idea is that it will be easier for companies to achieve multiple certifications if that's what they wish to do. So if you want to have uh, ISO 9001, ISO 14001, and say ISO 27001, that's now uh, uh, much easier to accomplish uh, with the Annex SL structure. Now, of course, all of the standards that ISO publishes, that's a lot of technical committees, that's a lot of voting, that's a lot of input from interested parties. So it's going to take some time uh, for this transition to uh, be completely uh, finished. Uh, at the present time, the plan is for all of the ISO standards to be transitioned by 2017. Uh, obviously, it is possible uh, that that will change as, uh, uh, as the work is undertaken. Let's take a few minutes now and go through the 10 section structure. And again, recognizing that these are the same 10 sections that you will eventually see for any ISO published standard. Uh, we begin with sections one, two, and three, uh, which uh, we'll dig into a little bit uh, more thoroughly in a few slides here, uh, but they are non-auditable sections. And that's actually no change from uh, ISO 9001-2008. Uh, the auditable portion of the standard begins with section four, context of the organization. Uh, we have uh, some new terminology here, some new ideas, talking about the context of an organization, interested parties is mentioned here, the development of your system, the development of your processes. These are all things that are covered in Section 4. In Section 5, we have a requirement called leadership and commitment. Uh, items such as customer focus, the developing of a policy statement, defining your roles and responsibilities are covered in Section 5. Section 6 is called planning and is the primary placeholder for uh, what we refer to as risk-based thinking requirements uh, and addressing risks and opportunities within the system. Section 6 is also where you will find discussion on the quality objectives and the planning to achieve quality objectives. Section 7 is called support. Uh, Section 7 uh, has a number of, of different requirements within it. We have 
requirements pertaining to competency. Uh, re, uh, resources is here. The new term documented information is found here. Uh, that refers to uh, documents and records. Uh, we'll be discussing that a bit later. Uh, Section 7 is also where you'll find requirements pertaining to monitoring and measuring devices, calibration, that sort of thing. So uh, between 4, 5, 6, and 7, uh, we have kind of a foundation being laid, uh, a, a foundation upon which uh, a quality system can be built. Uh, that in turn gives way to Section 8, and I would uh, opine that Section 8 is the most important section in the standard in terms of where the auditor is going to spend his or her time. Uh, section 8 is called operation and this is the placeholder for all of the primary activities of a quality system. So uh, the selling of a product, uh, purchasing activities, is, uh, they are found here, controlling production, controlling nonconformance, all of these are items that are found in Section 8. And that in turn gives way to Sections 9 and 10, which are called Performance Evaluation and Improvement. These are very much linked ideas, uh, and they also represent the Check and Act portion of the Plan, Do, Check, Act cycle. A lot of familiar content here, internal audit, management review, measurement, analysis, and so forth. And then under improvement, we have corrective action, continual improvement, and so forth. Now, in terms of the key changes, uh, what I've done uh, in my presentation is I've, I've tried to highlight the primary new content areas, things that are going to be subject to audit that were not subject to audit in quite this manner uh, before. Now obviously uh, for a lot of people the new scary requirement is risk and, and the whole idea of, of how is risk being viewed, how is it going to be approached in the audit process and so forth. Um, well there's a few things that you need to uh, be aware of uh, any discussion of risk. First of all the term risk is used 16 times in the auditable portion of ISO 9001-2015. It's not an item that is uh, a finite item. It's not something that stands off by itself. It is very much a system-wide strategy. Uh, the best parallel that I can draw is when ISO 9001-2000 was published. Uh, the new idea back then was continual improvement. And the way the continual improvement was explained was that this is something that affects all of your processes. This is something that impacts your entire quality management system. That is absolutely the same attitude that's being taken with risk management or risk-based thinking in, um, in ISO 9001-2015. Uh, and to that end, uh, it's been emphasized, uh, and it's even emphasized right in the standard itself, and I'll be pointing out where uh, in a little bit. Uh, a formal documented risk management process is not specifically required. Uh, the idea is that uh, risk aversion, risk-based thinking is something that exists uh, throughout your system and is a part of your existing processes. Let's take a look at the primary clauses uh, for risk, and, and they are 611 and 612. Because uh, again, there's, there's some important things to be uh, uh, pointed out here. When you're planning for your system, the organization needs to consider the issues that are referred to in 4.1. You'll note that that's both internal and external issues and the requirements referred to in 4.2. Now, the, in that instance, they're referring to both uh, inter, uh, interested parties that are internal and external to the organization. And once you've done that, you need to determine, and here's the key terms here, risks and opportunities. Uh, to put this bluntly, they're talking about bad stuff and good stuff here, right? 
uh, the, the idea is that your system is looking ahead. You, you are looking at what's coming and uh, you're reacting not just to risks but also to opportunities. And if you jump down to subclauses B and C, uh, you'll see how they've even spelled this out a bit further. A risk would represent an opportunity to prevent or reduce undesired effects. An opportunity would represent a chance to enhance desirable effects. Now, in both cases, we're trying to achieve uh, A and D, right? We want to give assurance that our system can do what it's supposed to do, and big picture, right, let's achieve improvement, because after all, improvement is still very much a, a guiding principle for the standard at large. So um, none of this, you'll know, none of this says anything about have a risk management process, have a separate risk management procedure, or anything of that nature. 612. Once you've identified those risks and opportunities, you will plan actions to address those risks and opportunities and, and this is key, how to integrate those actions into the system processes, into the processes that you already have, uh, and then to evaluate the effectiveness of said actions. Uh, actions taken to address risks and opportunities need to be proportionate to the potential impact on conformity of products and services. Um, in other words, you don't want to throw product and service conformity off the rails by the actions that you're taking. Now, there, there's a lot that's being said in these handful of words here, but again, the primary takeaway that I want you to have is that these are uh, actions that integrate into the processes you already have. The system at large needs to have risk-based thinking as a, as a component of, of what it is and what it does. Now in terms of, of what ISO 9001-2008 requirements uh, correlate to this idea, correlate to risk-based thinking and risk management, um, there are a number of things that are required under ISO 9001 that align nicely uh, with ISO 9001-2015 risk management, risk-based thinking. Here's the four most important ones. Management review, 5.6. You're already in the practice of assessing your system and uh, attempting to target improvement efforts. That's required under 5.6. 722, review of requirements related to the product. You're already assessing customer expectations against your current capabilities and you are required to resolve discrepancies when they occur. 622 training or competency. You're already required to assess your current competency against needs and taking steps to ensure that your personnel are qualified and competent. And 853, preventive action. Um, I have heard uh, many people raise questions about is preventive action going away under ISO 9001-2015? Well, the answer is yes and no. There, there's no longer uh, a section titled preventive action, but a preventive action strategy can absolutely uh, be part of your overall strategy for meeting the risk-based thinking slash risk management requirements. Okay, continuing on with uh, the important changes to the standard, let's look at some key terminology changes. Uh, the terms procedures, records, and documents have all been eliminated and they've been replaced with the term documented information. Now in Annex A6 we have an important clarification uh, related to this term and it talks about maintained documented information and retained documented information. And the difference is explained as follows. Maintained documented information is generally understood to be a replacement for any past reference to document procedure or quality manual. Now there's only a handful of items in the standard that represent uh, required maintained documented information. Uh, and these are, uh, for example, Clause 4.3, where it talks about uh, the 
uh, scope and, and that the scope of the system has to be defined uh, and maintained as documented information. Retain documented information uh, is generally understood as a replacement for past references to records. Uh, now obviously there's significantly more uh, in the way of required records in the standard. One uh, good example is in clause 933, uh, which requires that records of management review be, be retained. Another interesting change, uh, all references to product now read as products and services. Now, um, in, in terms of uh, uh, this being a huge change, uh, it's not really a big change. If you read Clause 3 of ISO 9001-2008, it does state that wherever the term product appears, it can also mean service. But the, uh, the writers of the standard felt that it was beneficial uh, to those companies that don't have a tangible product to have that term service uh, appear uh, right in the body of the standard itself uh, next to product. Management responsibility has become leadership uh, in terms of references. Uh, this is uh, pushing uh, the idea that management has to lead by example and involvement, uh, not simply directing that activities are performed. Continual improvement uh, is now uh, part of a much larger section uh, referred to as improvement. And the idea here is that continual improvement is uh, part of a strategy for improvement, but it is not exclusively what we would look for for improvement. Uh, the idea is that uh, you may have improvement through things like breakthroughs, reactive changes, reorganizations, and continual improvement should be viewed as part of a larger strategy. Interesting change to the term suppliers. Uh, the suppliers are now being referred to as external providers. And the term external providers is actually uh, a, a much broader term. Uh, and it's uh, discussed in the annex of the standard. And it says that external providers, in addition to suppliers, are going to refer to also associate companies and outsourcing. Now, uh, these were all items that were addressed in some way in ISO 9001-2008, but the larger picture now is that we have a common set of requirements for any external providers. Perhaps uh, one of the more controversial changes in the standard, uh, ISO 9001-2015 has eliminated uh, the requirement for a quality manual, and it has eliminated the requirements for any required procedures. Now, uh, our analysis on this has, has reached a couple of conclusions. But first of all, uh, an organization has to feel confident that it can control its processes in the manner that it best sees fit. And procedures are one way to control processes. They are certainly not uh, the only way, and, and they should not be viewed as an exclusive strategy. Um, however, having said that, uh, whatever methodology an organization chooses to use to control its processes, that methodology has to work. It has to be producing uh, consistent, reliable uh, results. Now, if you can do that without procedures, without a quality manual, uh, it will absolutely be considered acceptable. The 9001-2015 standard bears no mention of a management representative. Um, now this is uh, amplified a bit in section 5.1.1 of the standard where it talks about management leadership making itself accountable uh, for the uh, effectiveness of the system. And uh, we also feel that the elimination of management representative uh, means that not so much that the responsibilities are gone, uh, but that those responsibilities fall to the leadership of the organization. 
Now additionally, and I, I want to emphasize this, the fact that a management representative is no longer discussed in the standard does not necessarily mean that an organization is prohibited from appointing a key contact. You know, it, 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 it's absolutely uh, in some cases beneficial to have someone that arranges the audits, someone for the auditors to call, someone that will lead the auditors around during the audits, someone that uh, calls the corrective action meetings to order and things of this nature. But the leadership of the system needs to be responsible and accountable for the performance of the system. Uh, it's no longer going to be acceptable for the quality system to be dumped in one person's lap and for management to distance itself uh, from the functioning of that quality system. Now for many companies this is already how things are done and of course those companies will find transitioning to the new requirement uh, to be uh, relatively easy. The term permissible exclusions uh, no longer appears in the standard uh, and it's been replaced with a new designation uh, called non-applicable. Um, now this has a, a couple of impacts. Um, first of all, it means that any claim of non-applicable is going to be subject to uh, validation at each and every audit. Now, uh, this is no different than how we approach permissible exclusions now. Now the other change that is uh, a little more intriguing is that uh, by virtue of how the requirement is written, the entire standard, uh, potentially, portions of it, can be claimed as non-applicable. Now we've done some analysis on the standard and we've concluded that for the most part, the only sections that have requirements that could be conceivably excluded are going to be sections 7 and 8. And in the case of section 7, it's very limited. It's, it's primarily just the calibration requirement. Most of the conceivable legitimate exemptions are going to come from section 8. Now, your, your approach for, for documenting this is unlikely to change as a result of the transition to the new standard. 9001-2015 also uh, introduces a new term, uh, and that term is interested parties. Now, this is actually a term that's rooted in Annex SL and will, of course, uh, by virtue of that, it will appear in all of the ISO published standards. Let's take a look at the official definition for the term uh, interested party. And that is a person or organization that can affect, be affected by, or perceive themselves to be affected by a decision or activity. Now the examples that they give uh, include some of the obvious ones, customers, owners, uh, people within the organization and suppliers, but it goes beyond that and it talks about bankers and unions, and partners and competitors and so forth. Now, uh, Clause 4.2 of, of 9001 2015 gives uh, an important distinction to this requirement and it says that it's up to the organization to determine who their interested parties are and it's, in, it's up to the organization, furthermore, to determine who the relevant interested parties are. Now the intent is that um, you are the owners of your uh, quality system. You are going to be the ones uh, to ensure that it, you have considered all relevant inputs. Um, uh, we feel that the term interested party is intended to kind of broaden your perspective, broaden uh, who you're going to consider as, uh, as an input to your system. Now in practice this is not going to require uh, a great deal of, of additional implementation on your part. Ensuring that you are aware of applicable requirements, uh, that's simply good business. Let's take a look at some key new questions uh, from the standard, kind of on a section by section basis and, and reinforce uh, some of what we've talked about. In section four, uh, we have 
uh, the context of the organization, and we raise some uh, intriguing questions. What purpose does this organization serve? Uh, where are the issues coming from? Who are the interested parties? Can we claim any portion of the standard as non-applicable? In Section 5, we, we ask ourselves, do we have a leadership structure? Is leadership making itself accountable uh, for the system? Are the quality policy and objectives consistent with the strategic direction of the company? Uh, has the policy been made available to all interested parties? Uh, have the quality system processes been integrated into business activity? Now on that last one, you'll note that that does not mean your financial records will be subject to audit. In Section 6, we, we're looking at planning uh, in the, uh, the whole idea of risk-based thinking. And as we looked at earlier, have we considered the risks? Have we considered the opportunities? Are we taking appropriate action on said risks and opportunities? Looking at quality objectives, do we know who's responsible? Do we know what the target date is? Do we know what it is we're trying to accomplish? And are those objectives relevant to the conformity of products? And do they enhance customer satisfaction? Section 7 uh, has uh, a key new idea in it called organizational management. And that's understood to be knowledge gained from experience. And do we have a system in place to retain uh, knowledge gained from experience? Uh, furthermore, 716 asks us, do we have a process in place to examine changing needs and trends against your current competency base and determine what's needed for the future? Now, beyond organizational knowledge, there's no other significant new content that we didn't have before in 9001-2008. In Section 8, Operation, this requirement is very similar uh, to Section 7 uh, from ISO 9001-2008. Uh, really, no significant new content that we didn't have already uh, in 9001-2008. And that's also true for Section 9. Uh, really, the only big change here is that uh, we've aligned management review with internal audit and some of the other system monitoring type activities. And Section 10, improvement, again, very similar uh, to uh, the predecessor in 9001-2008. No significant new content. So hopefully uh, what you are feeling now after having reviewed those last couple of slides is that the changes to the 9001 standard, these are minimal changes. These are manageable changes. Even risk is not such a new idea if you consider that preventive action has been part of the 9001 standard since it was first published. What I'd like to do for you now is over the next few slides, uh, we're going to do a cover-to-cover -cover analysis on the content of the standard, give you a sense of, of what's where, and a few pointers on the uh, purposes of these sections. We'll start with section 0.1 at the very front end of the standard. Uh, 0.1 is called general. Uh, it gives an overview statement, some ideas on who the standard benefits. It introduces the ideas of risk-based thinking uh, and Plan, Do, Check, Act. And it explains four key terms uh, that are used uh, in the standard. Now, three of these are getting official definitions for the first time. Uh, shall, uh, this is of course a legacy term, uh, indicates a mandatory requirement. Uh, obviously there are numerous uh, instances of the term shall within the standard. Should is understood as a recommendation. There are actually no uses of the term should uh, in the standard itself, at least within the auditable content. May is understood as a permission. That term actually appears once in the auditable content. Uh, specifically in Clause 4.3, and then can indicates a possibility or capability. Numerous instances of that term in the standard. In 0.2, uh, 
we are given a listing of the seven quality management principles and a reference to the ISO 9000 standard where these quality management principles are uh, more further discussed. Now you'll note uh, that these seven quality management principles are very similar uh, to the eight quality management principles that existed in the prior structure. Uh, in this case, the third item, engagement of people, represents a combining of two former uh, principles. 0.3 is called process approach, reinforces the importance of process approach, reinforces plan, do, check, act as well, and provides an improved graphic. 033 is the first of two sections uh, specific for risk-based thinking. Uh, the other comes up in Annex A. Again, provides a further definition and an explanation of the importance of the concept of risk-based thinking. 0.4 draws a relationship between uh, 9001 and the support standards, 9000 and 9004. We'll have a word about those in just a bit. Sections 1, 2, and 3, as I mentioned, are non-auditable, uh, but they do serve a couple of distinct purposes. Section 1 is called scope. Uh, it's some general verbiage pertaining to the applicability of ISO 9001 and, and what it's intended to apply to and for whom. Section 2 establishes a normative reference linking ISO 9001 to ISO 9000 uh, for all official terms and definitions. And Section 3 uh, is called Terms and Definitions, but it's currently without content. There are no ISO 9001 specific definitions. That may change uh, in the future, uh, but for now, uh, that section is without content. We've already reviewed the general content in Sections 4 through 10, so let's jump ahead to Annex A. Now, of all of the non-auditable material written in the standard, I uh, absolutely feel that Annex A is the most beneficial. Uh, it's an eight-part annex, uh, and there's a lot of what I would call uh, plain-spoken good advice, really, uh, in this uh, annex. Um, the other thing that's, that's critical about the fact that it's in Annex A of the actual standard is that it's binding. These are binding interpretations uh, of some of these requirements, and uh, they represent a, uh, an official judgment, so to speak. So, you know, if, if there are points of disagreement between uh, auditors and auditees or between auditors and certification bodies, Annex A is intended to be uh, kind of a judgment uh, on interpreting some of these uh, key items. Uh, let's start with A1. A1 is called Structure and Terminology. And what A1 lays out in a, a couple of lines is that uh, if an organization is transitioning to 9001 2015, um, you don't necessarily have to align your documentation to match it. Uh, and furthermore, you don't even have to use the specific terms that are found in the standards. So uh, if you want to call if you want to maintain an internal audit procedure and call it Procedure 8.2.2, which would, of course, align it with 9001-2008, there's no reason that that procedure can't remain as is uh, under a 9001-2015 quality system. Uh, and furthermore, uh, with the terminology, uh, give you an example of this. If you are comfortable calling them suppliers, keep calling them suppliers. There's no reason that you have to start suddenly calling them external providers uh, just because the standard uh, changed the terminology that's used. Uh, in Annex A2, uh, we have a full explanation of the intent in changing all references of product to read products and services. Uh, A3 uh, is a very helpful section on understanding interested parties. We actually had an extract from that uh, a bit earlier in the presentation. A4, risk-based thinking. This is an extensive section that's intended to help uh, understand the concept uh, a bit better. Uh, and this is where it is made official that you do not have to have a formal structure or process for risk management as part of your quality system. You do not have to have a standalone process uh, for that activity. 
Annex A5 talks about the logic in removing exclusions from the 9001 standard and digs a bit into the new concept of non-applicables. Uh, A6, documented information, we looked at this one earlier as well, the idea of the difference between maintained documented information and retained documented information. A7, organizational knowledge, we had some bits and pieces of this earlier as well. Uh, an explanation of the requirements pertaining to competency, competency and the challenges that organizations face as it pertains to competency. And then A8, uh, this is another one that we looked at a bit earlier, uh, external providers and externally provided products and services. Who are we referring to in that instance? Standard concludes with Annex B. Uh, the, uh, which provides an extensive discussion on the relationship between 9001 uh, and various other publications such as 9004, 10001 and so forth, uh, and finally a bibliography. Now, um, hopefully by this point in our presentation you've been able to answer this question for yourself, but let's address it anyhow. Do you have to overhaul your system to meet the new requirements? Uh, the answer to that question is a resounding no. You absolutely do not have to overhaul your system. Um, one of the goals of the TC176 committee uh, in writing the new standard was to improve its inclusiveness, inclusiveness. Now, there are over a million worldwide registered firms to ISO 9001. If every single one of those companies has to overhaul their system, to meet the new requirements, that's not inclusive. So uh, it is absolutely not required that you overhaul your system. Uh, if, for example, if you like your quality manual and it fits what you do, you can absolutely keep your quality manual. If the procedures that you have developed are value added, if they help define your key processes and define how they operate, absolutely keep your procedures. If your policy, if your objectives are well known, if they're adding value, you can absolutely keep those as well. Let's transition now to an exploration of uh, the FAQs that have come up. Uh, perhaps some of your questions will be answered in these next few slides. Will our staff have to complete transition training? This is going to be to an extent dependent on uh, the uh, extent of your revisions. How extensive are the revisions that you're making to your system? Uh, but generally, you will be expected to provide some form of transition training to your staff. Uh, at minimum, our expectation is that your staff will be aware of the new standard and uh, there will have been an assessment on the standard's impact on the various processes and personnel. Uh, it's absolutely conceivable that the majority of your staff, particularly in production type areas, will feel no effect whatsoever uh, from your transition to ISO 9001-2015. What about internal auditors? Do they have to complete transitional training? Well, the thing you have to remember about internal auditing is that it is one of many competencies uh, that you have within a quality management system. And who defines competency for an organization's quality management system? Well, the organization does. And so accordingly, uh, each organization is going to have to decide on its own what is the extent of transition training that will be needed. Now, if you have a seasoned team of internal auditors, who have been auditing your quality system for many years, it's absolutely conceivable that those uh, auditors could complete a period of self-study and successfully transition to auditing the new standard. Um, now, in terms of how we verify the uh, effectiveness and competency of your internal auditors, uh, we will do that as we always have uh, through an assessment of the overall effectiveness of the internal audit process itself. Will the other standards be updated as well? 
Uh, yes, uh, all of the major sector-specific standards, uh, including TS-16949, AS-9100, TL-9000, etc., have indicated their intention to continue their alignment with ISO 9001. Uh, we know, uh, particularly for TS-16949 and AS-9100, we know uh, that 2016 is what is being targeted for publication. Uh, we don't have firm publication dates yet. Uh, in terms of uh, a standard that is not going to continue its alignment with 9001, uh, ISO 13485, which is, of course, the medical devices standard. Uh, the 2016 version of ISO 13485 was actually published in March of this year, and it was written to align with ISO 9001-2008. Uh, we will be providing uh, some further updates on ISO 9001-13485 uh, in the near future. Should we get certified now or wait? Uh, now, uh, there are a number of companies that are at various stages of implementing a quality system. And perhaps for some of those companies, they began working with ISO 9001-2008, and they're wondering, understandably so, is there still value in registering to ISO 9001-2008? Well, obviously, PJR cannot make the final decision for you, um, but it is important for you to bear in mind a couple of key things. Uh, first of all, 9001-2008 still has, at this moment, uh, just under two and a half years of usability left in it. Uh, it's also important for you to bear in mind that although we are currently auditing to 9001-2015, these early audits are not an easy matter for auditee or for auditors. We're still getting uh, accustomed to the new standard ourselves. Now, as time goes by, uh, the auditors are going to get more comfortable auditing it, and this will ensure a smooth transition. As to what steps you can take right now, uh, I would encourage you to follow the seven-step process outlined in IAF ID 9. And what are those steps? First, to review the standard. Purchase the standard and have a top management review to identify any gaps that exist within your system. Write out a plan of implementation and assign responsibilities therein. Uh, ensure that any documents uh, that are needed uh, are updated uh, to reflect any new or revised processes. Conduct awareness and transition training with your staff. Have a full internal audit performed. Follow that with a management review meeting. Ensure that corrective action for all internal audit findings is in process or complete. And at that point, coordinate with PJR for planning of your official transition. I do want to make, uh, again, uh, a final point on documentation transition. Your documentation has to work for you first and foremost. Uh, if that means renumbering it, if that accomplishes that goal better, then go for it. But that will not be required. I want to also encourage you to work with your auditor. Many of you have had uh, many years of working with a single auditor, someone that at this point knows your system inside and out, knows your people. Um, and we are looking to our auditors to provide expert analyses of quality systems against audit criteria. Uh, we feel that your auditors are going to be a valuable resource to you in your transition process. This is absolutely an exciting time for quality system certification. Uh, we feel that 9001-2015 is a beneficial update to a standard that has had a long track record of contribution. Uh, PJR will continue to provide timely updates on this transition process, and we will endeavor to ensure our clients have as smooth a transition as possible. Quick update on the support standards. Uh, ISO 9000, the Fundamentals and Vocabulary Standard, uh, was published uh, on the same day as 9001, September 15, 2015, and it is available for purchase. 
Uh, the 9000 standard contains all sanctioned definitions, the seven quality management principles, and a series of concept diagrams showing the intended interrelationships of ideas. Now, as before, the 9000 standard is not certifiable. The 9004 and 19011 standards both remain at their current revisions for the time being. Uh, it is uh, a foregone conclusion that 9004 will be getting an update, and in fact, uh, we've been told that it will be getting an update. As to whether 19011 will be getting uh, a firm update, uh, at this particular moment, we have not been told. We have prepared a couple of additional reports that we feel may be helpful to you. Uh, both of these are available right on our website. Uh, first, a side-by-side -side comparison between ISO 9001-2008 and ISO 9001-2015, and also an FAQ report, including uh, the FAQs that we reviewed earlier in our presentation. I would like to invite you to join us for one of our other webinars. Uh, ISO 9001-2015, Critical Points of Review During the Transition Audit Process, is given on a once-monthly basis. Uh, it is a deep dive into the new areas represented by ISO 9001-2015 and an examination of how they will be audited during the transition audit itself. The interaction of processes and its importance to a successful audit, also shown once monthly. It's an exploration of the critical topic of processes and how to correctly understand them. And finally, what to expect during your stage one audit. This is a new webinar uh, currently under development and will be premiering soon. We do want to keep in touch with you and the very best way for us to do that is if you visit our website and opt in. Uh, if you go to www.pjr.com, go to the bottom of the page, enter your email address and click subscribe, you'll be kept automatically informed of news updates, pending uh, changes, webinars, and so forth. I do thank you for your time today. I'm going to go ahead and unlock the question portion of the dashboard and see what questions we have today. Okay, we have a question from Wilbert Vivas asking, is it acceptable to demonstrate risk-based thinking along an organization's activities without calling them specifically risk? I would say, uh, Wilbert, that that sounds conceivable. Uh, I would have to look at the individual case. If, if what you're driving at is uh, problem avoidance uh, and, and uh, taking advantage of opportunities, uh, I would say that that is conceivable and perhaps uh, possible. Wilbert goes on to ask, is it possible to continue using the term preventive action as part of actions to address risks and opportunities? Absolutely. Absolutely, uh, that would be appropriate. Timothy Main asks, if you do renumber your documentation, would you reset the revision to zero? Um, Timothy, I don't think that would be uh, inappropriate. That, that, that strikes me as, as something that you should be able to do. It is, after all, a newly numbered, newly named procedure. That doesn't strike me as unreasonable at all. Uh, you're simply uh, discontinuing an existing procedure and introducing a new one with much of the same content. Hilda Reyes asks, uh, uh, if we will be getting uh, copies of this out, uh, uh, perhaps some of you have the same question. Uh, absolutely, we always do make the slides available shortly after the presentation is concluded. Uh, and I will also share with you that the presentation with voiceover uh, will also uh, very shortly be available for reviewing right here on our website. Uh, glad you enjoyed the presentation, Hilda. Okay, any further questions today?
Okay, Cheryl Van Sun asks, what resources are available to tap into to provide evidence to show part of risk analysis and so we have to have metrics for each process? Cheryl, the, the important thing to bear in mind with, with risk analysis and risk management um, and, and risk-based thinking, and then these are all terms that are, are being loosely uh, used interchangeably. Uh, again, bear in mind that this is something that is supposed to be a part of your uh, entire system. It's not a standalone process. I will also point out that you are required to discuss uh, risk actions as part of your management review meeting. So, um, you know, for, for a company that's looking for a strategy, um, it's certainly appropriate to, to align those two ideas. The fact that you're supposed to be looking at these things as part of the management review requirement anyhow. Uh, and Cheryl, I think the second part of your question is metrics for each process. Uh, that requirement is, is relatively unchanged from the prior version of the standard, uh, and that is that you are required to have key performance indicators, objectives, um, but they don't necessarily have to be unique objectives for each and every one of your process. There are, are certainly instances where an objective may reflect on more than one um, process. Anything further I can help with today? Okay, getting some nice feedback on the webinar. You're, you're quite welcome. It's my pleasure. Okay, uh, I will thank all of you for your time. Have a great day.